and the progress of this flood insurance bill is indicative of that fact. And with that, I um, yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Gentlewoman from Illinois. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself the balance of, of my time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, this bill is the 17th short-term extension of the National Flood Insurance Program. Our colleagues in the Senate have assured us that in June they will take up the version of a long-term NFIP reauthorization and reform bill, so I am confident that this will be our last short-term extension. H.R. 5740 with the Senate amendment, amendment extends the program for an additional two months in order to protect homeowners, communities in flood-prone areas, and the housing market. Included at least one reform provision in H.R. 5740 to eliminate subsidized rates for second and vacation homes reduces some of NFIP's risk to taxpayers. H.R. 5740 also buys the House and Senate two more times to finalize a larger bill to reauthorize the five years and reform the National Flood Insurance Program. Eleven months ago, over 400 members of the House from both sides of the aisle voted for H.R. 1309 to reform this program. This, and this, actually the reform bill uh, passed out of the Financial Services Committee 54 to nothing. So this is a real uh, bipartisan uh, effort. The House also has approved the same five-year NFIP reauthorization and reform bill as part of the Middle Class Tax Re Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 in December and as part of the Reconciliation uh, Act that was passed a couple weeks ago. And again, earlier this month, over 400 members of the House voted for the first version of H.R. 5740 to ensure that NFIP uh, doesn't lapse. NFIP is over $17 billion in debt, as I said, to taxpayers, and it cannot continue without reforms, but shouldn't lapse, particularly at the start of the, of the hur hurricane season, which begins this week on June 1st. Uh, with that, I urge my colleagues to to again support H.R. 5740. And finally, I would really like to thank uh, Ms. Waters for uh, co-sponsoring this bill as the lead co-sponsor, and Mr. Scott from Georgia for uh, managing uh, time for the other side, and all of other members on both sides of the aisle that have supported. We've had a, a really great turnout for the NFIP reform effort. Yes, Norman. yes, I yield. I'd just like to correct. Um, I m misspoke when I referred to Ms. Waters as the ranking member of the Housing Subcommittee. That honor goes to the Congressman Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez. So I just wanted to correct that. Ms. Waters was the former chairman of the Housing Committee. But all of us worked together in such a way, but uh, I did want to correct that as Mr. Gutierrez and not uh, Ms. Waters, who is the uh, uh, ranking member. Thank, and I thank, thank you. The, I thank the gentleman. And, uh, uh, yes, both, uh, but both of the members have been uh, great in, in working with, with this, and I know that Ms. Waters has uh, been the ranking member for this committee in the, in the past and has always worked on the flood insurance. So I, I, thank, I thank you, and with that, uh, I would yield back the balance of my time. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the question is, will the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate amendment to H.R. 5740? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The Senate amendment is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 4041 as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 4041, a bill to amend the Export Enhancement Act of 1988 to further enhance the promotion of exports of United States goods and services and for other purposes. 
Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Manzullo, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman, will each control 20 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Manzullo. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend and to submit extraneous materials for the record. Without objection. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Ge gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, this bill has been many years in the making and as a result of several hearings, including the one I held as chairman of the House Small Business Committee back in 2006. This is simply a good government bill that costs nothing. I recognize that market forces play a predominant role in international trade. However, export promotion programs can play a useful role in helping small and medium-sized enterprises find new markets and customers overseas. Several small companies in northern Illinois expanded their operations and hired new workers after U.S. Commercial Service identified new exporting opportunities. Also, according to the National District Export Council, every one dollar spent on export promotion has resulted in $135 in exports. However, many of our trade promotion programs are not fully integrated. This has been confirmed in various Government Accountability Office, GAO, and Inspector General reports measuring the effectiveness of the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee, which is known as TPCC. Congressional intent behind the legislation this committee passed in 1992 has not been fulfilled. <clears throat> Our trading partners are well organized and effectively market their business overseas. I recall on one of my trips to China some years ago, the CEO of a very large uh, Chinese manufacturing company told me he often sees Europeans and Japanese as trade promotion officials but he had yet to see Americans doing the same thing. And he asked me the question, where are the Americans? According to the National District Export Council, while the U.S. spends about 21 cents per thousand dollars of total exports on trade promotion programs and services, Japan spends 30 cents, France spends 43 cents, and Great Britain spends 75 cents. With small businesses offering the best prospect to boost export growth, we should make every effort to get the greatest return for any taxpayer money spent on export promotion. In 2006 and 2008, I introduced legislation that would reform the TPCC and move its responsibilities into the executive office of the president. I was pleased in 2010 when the president announced the formulation of the export cabinet and adopted many of the reform ideas contained in my legislation, such as instituting measurable benchmarks for achieving goals set forth in the annual National Export Strategy Report. However, there is one key reform missing from the President's proposal, having an integrated trade budget. Currently, each trade promotion agency submits its own budget to the Office of Management and Budget, and the President for on its own without a separate review as to whether or not each request fits within the overall trade agenda for the U.S. government. The TPCC needs budget review authority in order to be fully effective. In 2010, I was proud to join with our former colleague, Representative Gabby Giffords, in introducing legislation to remedy this problem. While the bill did not pass in the previous Congress, I'm proud to join with my good friend, Representative Howard Berman, in continuing Ms. Lef Gifford's legacy in supporting the Export Promotion Reform Act. While the President issued a, subsequ a subsequent memorandum last February that would give the Export Cabinet and the TPCC the ability to make recommendations to the Office of Management and Budget, Budget for more effective use of trade promotion funds, this bill is needed to codify and clarify this role to guarantee that the TPCC will be able to influence decisions on the President's budget, on the President's budget request prior to its submission to Congress. Process and good government reforms oftentimes do not get the attention they deserve. However, this bill recognizes their importance. I urge my colleagues to support this bill because it will ultimately benefit small and medium-sized exporters. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. 
chair will now recognize uh, the Mr. Berman uh, from California. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I rise in strong support of H.R. 4041 and yield myself such time as I may consume. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Export Promotion Reform Act is a bipartisan, non-controversial bill that will help increase the export of American goods and services and in the process create new high-quality jobs. I want to really thank the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Manzullo, uh, for working with me on this legislation. He has been one of the strongest voices for export promotion and export control reform in this chamber, and he's been a great partner to have on this legislation. And I also want to thank uh, my chairman the, of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Eliana ross Leighton, and her staff for helping to move this through the legislative process to this point. H.R. 4041 would implement recommendations by the GAO, the Governmental Accountability Office, to make more effective use of our export promotion programs. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the bill doesn't authorize any new programs, nor does it add any new spending or impose any new mandates. And I'd ask unanimous consent to include the CBO anal analysis at this point in the record. Without objection. Thank you. The bill has been endorsed by a number of prominent business organizations, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and the Business Roundtable. And I'd ask unanimous consent that the letters of support from these organizations be included in the record at this point. Without objection. The Export Promotion Reform Act would make sound, practical improvements that would benefit many of the nation's 293,000 exporting firms, more than 97 percent of which are small and medium-sized businesses, while exercising fiscal prudence on behalf of the American taxpayer. American firms have renewed opportunities for growth and increased employment through increased sales overseas. However, the competition in world trade is fierce, and our export promotion programs often don't measure up to those of our competitors. GAO has told us repeatedly that these programs would be more effective with improved coordination. To that end, H.R. 4041 would eliminate duplicative activities and improve service delivery to exporters, require a global plan to identify and target the best growth markets for U.S. goods and services, and require our ambassadors to develop country-by-country -country commercial diplomacy plans aimed at increasing U.S. exports, while making the effectiveness of their commercial diplomacy efforts part of their annual performance review. Mr. Speaker, the U.S. Department of Commerce estimates that every one billion in U.S. exports supports approximately 5,800 jobs here at home. With 95 percent of the world's consumers living overseas, expanding U.S. export world market to world markets is one of the best ways for American business to grow and create jobs. I urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Manzillo. Gentleman I yield back. back. Gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 4041 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leads of absence requested for Mr. Burton of Indiana for today and the balance of the week. Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska for today and the balance of the week. Mr. Heinrich of New Mexico for today. Ms. Velasquez of New York for today. And Mr. Young of Florida for today. Without objection, the requests are granted. Now entertain one minute requests. Chair now lays before the House an enrolled bill. H.R. 5740, an act to extend the National Flood Insurance Program and for other purposes. Under 
25, 2011, gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to honor May as Jewish American Heritage Month. I also ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks on the topic of this special order. Without objection. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be joined by my colleagues tonight as we honor our nation's Jewish community through Jewish American Heritage Month. As the first Jewish woman to represent the state of Florida in the United States Congress, I am so proud to be a strong voice on many issues crucial to our community, from tolerance and understanding to tikkun olam, repairing the world. In 2005, members of the Jewish community in South Florida approached me with the idea to designate a month to honor the contributions of American, that American Jews have made to our nation. As a result, I was the proud sponsor of Jewish American Heritage Month, which the House and Senate unanimously passed in 2006 and has been, been proclaimed by both President Bush and President Obama annually since then. This year, in 2012, is the seventh annual Jewish American Heritage Month. JAM promotes awareness of the contributions American Jews have made to the fabric of American life, from technology and literature to entertainment, politics, and medicine. As we are all well aware, the foundation of our country is built upon the strengths of our unique cultures and backgrounds. The American Jewish experience is the story of the immigrant, the labor movement, the battle for civil rights, and so much more. Jews in America have blazed trails from the battlefield to the Supreme Court, from the sports field and symphony hall to the pages of our nation's history books and our nation's capital. From the time of the colonies until today, Jewish communities have played a significant role in American history and telling the American story. That's why communities across the country have come together to celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month during the month of May. Seven years ago, this idea gained momentum as 250 of my colleagues joined me as original co-sponsors of a resolution urging the President to issue a proclamation for this important month. Senator Arlen Specter led the effort in the Senate, and together the House and Senate unanimously passed resolutions supporting the creation of Jewish American Heritage Month. Now, each year, the month of May introduces Jewish culture to the entire country in order to raise awareness and dispel harmful preju prejudices. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, we have seen a precipitous rise in intolerance and anti-Semitism, not just in this country, but ac across the globe. And it's my hope that by providing the framework for the discussion of Jewish culture and contributions to our nation, we'll be able to reduce the ignorance that ultimately leads to anti-Semitism. You know, over the last number of years, I, I uh, have talked about the impact and the contributions of the Jewish community to our country over more than 350 years of Jewish life in America. And it has always struck me uh, that Jews in America are less than 2% of the American population. And so as such, many of our colleagues, most Americans, never actually spend much time around the Jewish community. So our traditions, are unfamiliar, our culture and, uh, and our religion, uh, which, of which we are both, are, are not something that most folks encounter every day. And that's the reason that we honor communities like the Jewish community with a cultural awareness month so that we can raise that awareness and, and make sure that people who don't usually have an opportunity to get the kinds of information that, uh, that, that these months provide can, can really reach out to one another and, uh, and learn more so that we can be the melting pot uh, and also the salad bowl that is always debated about, uh, about, uh, about the United States of America. Over the last seven years, we've seen JAM grow from an inspired idea to a national reality. We've had a group of committed organizations and museums around the country that have been working to get JAM into the classroom, on the airwaves, and into the halls of our government, as today's activities demonstrate. Just before votes this evening, President Obama hosted the third annual Jewish American Heritage Month reception at the White House, welcoming leaders from the Jewish community into the nation's house. He told the story, the President told the story, uh, not, a, uh, not a really wonderful uh, note in our nation's history, of General Ulysses Grant, who at the time of the Civil War had actually issued an order, Mr. Speaker, to expel Jews from their homes 
in the war zone during the Civil War. President Obama went on to also talk about how President Lincoln issued an order rescinding that order. And the Library of Congress uh, brought out from its archives all of the documents related to General Grant's order and President Lincoln's order to make sure that we could protect the rights of individuals and make sure that our commitment as a nation to religious tolerance and freedom was preserved uh, for, from now, from then and, and through, uh, through history. And tonight, I'm so pleased to be joined by my colleagues to commemorate the American Jewish experience. From sports games to concerts to lectures and films, JAM is truly an interdisciplinary and multimedia experience and we want to see these efforts continue to grow. However, it's vital that this idea takes hold not only for Jewish organizations, because after all, we're already familiar with, uh, with the contributions of Jewish life in America, and we want to make sure that this month is an opportunity to grow that, that knowledge and reach out to communities across the country. It's our responsibility to continue this education. If we as a nation are to prepare our children for the challenges that lie ahead, then teaching diversity and celebrating it is a fundamental part of that promise. Together, we can help achieve this goal of understanding with the celebration of Jewish American Heritage Month. The lessons of Judaism inspire us to do great things, from our commitment to service, to our political advocacy, to our cultural contributions for this nation. Together, we can and should celebrate our community's history and values, so that not only the Jewish people, but all Americans may go from strength to strength. And now I'm delighted to recognize one of my colleagues who has been an incredible leader for the United States of America, for the people of her district in New York, and someone that I am proud to say has been a mentor throughout my time here in the U.S. House of Representatives, Congresswoman Nita Lowy from the great state of New York. And by the way, let me add, Mr. Speaker, that the Congresswoman Lowy is the ranking member of the Foreign Operations Subcommittee on the Appropriations Committee. Well, let me thank my outstanding colleague from the state of Florida, Congressman, Congresswoman <laughs> Wasserman Schultz. And I personally want to express my appreciation for the work you have done to make this day a reality so that we can all acknowledge Jewish American Heritage Month. It's because of you that this day is noted and it's because of you that we have gathered at the White House for a really inspirational speech from President Obama. So Thanks. as a Jewish American I want to express my appreciation to you and I know that it may not be coincidental that this was a special time in your life <laughs> this past week. I think it's appropriate that we talk about your family and your personal commitment to your Jewish heritage and during this month, <laughs> last week I believe, your daughter celebrated her bat mitzvah or b'nai mitzvah. My son and daughter. And this is such an amazing, amazing time in your life when your daughter or your son reaches that point where they have studied, they have learned what it is to be a Jewish American here in the United States of America. And I am sure that your family was just overflowing <laughs> with joy. And I just want to say mazel tov Thank to you. you. <laughs> that means good luck and congratulations. So today I not only rise, Mr. Speaker, to express my appreciation to Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz for making this Jewish American Heritage Month an annual tradition, but to express my appreciation to you for organizing this event tonight. And I rise to mark the contributions of Jewish Americans to the rich culture and history of our nation during this Jewish American Heritage Month. Jewish tradition embraces the concept of tikkun olam, 
repairing the world. And indeed, our actions in Congress are aimed at that concept, helping to improve our society, create equity for all, Americans through quality health care, education, and economic opportunity, regardless of their ethnic, cultural, or socioeconomic background. And what I am very proud of is that our commitment to justice reaches beyond our borders. The history of the Jewish people reminds us of our unique responsibility in the international community to stand up for what is right, speak out against hatred and injustice, and ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust are not lost to history. We have a responsibility and we must defend those unjustly persecuted, no matter where they are, and we must stand by our ally Israel in the face of continued threats. I hope you will join me in celebrating the rich history of Jewish Americans and in looking forward to an even more vibrant and just future for all people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Lowy. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment uh, as a Jewish American woman and for blazing a trail. And, as, as a, and thank you for acknowledging my, uh, my daughter and son's uh, bar and bat mitzvah. They, uh, Ooh, it, was the twins. it was the twins, yes. Uh -huh. both, of, both of them. And it was a, a pretty incredible week. And it was uh, really amazing uh, to coincidentally have the B'nai Mitzvah service uh, and ceremony during Jewish American Heritage Month. Their birthday is May 15th, and uh, we had a wonderful celebration last weekend. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for being an incredible example. As a Jewish mother uh, who is raising Jewish daughters, thank you for being an incredible example for them. Well, as a Jewish mother <laughs> and a Jewish grandmother, uh, I am very proud of my three children and my eight grandchildren. And I just want to say again that you are really a role model for all women, not just Jewish women, a strong woman with integrity who is committed to her Judaism, her family, and yet you understand so well that we have an obligation beyond ourselves as we lift people up and hope that all people in the United States and America and around the world have the opportunity to raise children and have a good life and can have a future. So I want to thank you because you are a role model that just does it all. <laughs> In fact, Thanks. it's amazing to me that you've done it all. Thank you so, so much. So congratulations. Thank you. thank you again for marking this important month for all of us. Thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. It is now my privilege. It, it, boy, it's, it's, uh, it, it would, it's hard to say enough good things about a, an incredible woman, a, a fighter, someone who has been a champion for the values that I know I was raised to believe in around my family dinner table growing up, the, the epitome of tikkun olam. And Mr. Speaker, let me, uh, we're going to use some Yiddish phrases here and, and Hebrew, uh, Hebrew expressions uh, tonight that, uh, that some may not understand, but the foundation of the Jewish community and our commitment to service and our commitment to fighting injustice is, is based in the notion of tikkun olam, which means repairing the world. And so often we have uh, mountains in front of us that seem so tough to climb, and repairing the world can seem like an insurmountable obstacle, but working together to address a little bit of injustice, just a, a small bite at a time, but banding together to do it, is, uh, is something that the Jewish community has stood for for many years. And there is no finer example of someone... I, I have to tell you that Jan Schakowsky, as a representative from Illinois, and as someone who had a reputation that I became aware of long before I actually had the privilege of serving in this institution, was someone I wanted to be like when I grew up. Because she has been the absolute epitome of what 
I know I was taught to believe in around my family table, which was that we should stand up for people who have no voice, fight for the civil rights and civil liberties uh, that we are all, in, that are instilled as Jewish values. And I, I'm so thrilled that you joined us here tonight. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky from the great state of Illinois. Thank you so much, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, for your leadership role in making American, uh, Jewish American Heritage Month a reality. Really, this was your idea, and you mobilized the members of the House in a bipartisan way to make this, this happen, and we're so appreciative. I think Jews and non-Jews alike realize that it's important that we honor the, the, the culture and the heritage of the, the Jewish community. Throughout American history, Jewish Americans have helped shape American culture and society. For over 350 years, Jewish Americans have made untold contributions to our country through science, art, medicine, education, sports, technology, entertainment, and government. Jewish Americans have served in the military and in government, have helped build and grow our economy, and have served their communities as teachers, nurses, organizers, and in countless other critical roles. American Jews played a critical role in creating and sustaining a homeland for all Jews around the world, the state of Israel, our beloved state of Israel. First as a refuge for those who um, survived the, uh, the, the Holocaust, continuing to be a place where all Jews are welcome, and today an enduring and essential ally of the United States of America. As a first generation Jewish American, I have personally witnessed the struggles and successes of Jewish immigrants who came to this nation in order to create a better life for themselves, their families, and future generations. The reasons that all immigrants seek out the United States. Like other important immigrant communities, the Jewish experience in the United States represents the promise, the opportunity, and the freedom of America. I think today about my grandparents, Sam and Mary Kasnow, who um, settled in Chicago with three of their four um, children. The fourth was born in the United States. My mother was, was not. They came from Russia. They um, left a, a place that they knew they would never return to, left a place where there were pogroms, where it was dangerous for, uh, for the Jews, and, and, and came to uh, Chicago, Illinois. And every Sunday, we would go to my grandparents' house in Humble Park, and I would rush out to um, what is now the garage, but then was the barn, where Teddy the horse, was there, and I would say hello first to, uh, to Teddy, I think even before my grandparents. And Teddy would pull the cart that my grandfather, a peddler, um, would, uh, uh, every weekday he would get up at the crack of dawn and take Teddy and the, and the wagon to the uh, vegetable and fruit market several miles away and, and load up the, uh, the cart. And carry bags of potatoes up several flights of stairs in the alleys of, uh, of Humboldt Park to his, his customers. My grandmother stayed home. She, would make the, she made the clothes for, for her children and was a homemaker. And they put all of their children through college. That was the American dream. My grandfather, as a peddler, now college tuition wasn't what it is today and it was easier to uh, to do that but two teachers one lawyer one uh, business uh, college uh, student um, all of those children of Sam Cosnow the peddler could make it in in America that is the American dream. It's the immigrant dream. It's a dream of hard-working people who believe that if you are willing to get up at the crack of dawn and, and carry potatoes up the back porch that, y that you could do it here. That's the America we dream for everyone and for, for our, our children and their children that, that, they can, that they can have a good life if they are willing to, to work hard. An estimated 250,000 Jews live in Chicago today. 
Chicago's vibrant Jewish community has been home to countless prominent figures from sports to the arts to politics. Saul Alinsky, the father of community organizing, came from a Russian Jewish immigrant family. Nobel Prize winning author Saul Bellow grew up in Chicago, a Jewish uh, from Humboldt Park as my grandparents and my parents lived. Um, and, uh, and his work strongly reflects both his Jewish roots and the city of Chicago. Actors Jeremy Piven and Mandy Patinkin were both raised in Jewish households in Chicago. And Benny Goodman, the clarinetist known as the King of Swing, called Chicago home. Cindy Yates, my predecessor, served in the house for nearly 50 years, passionately working for environmental protection and government funding for the arts. And two current members of the Chicago Bears NFL team, um, Gabe Kar Karimi and Adam Podish, uh, uh, let me see, it's Podlish, are Jewish Americans. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, Jewish American Heritage Month is an opportunity to recognize, recognize the contributions of Jewish Americans to our community, to our country, to our culture. For 350 years, Jewish Americans have made extraordinary contributions to American life and uh, culture. And in Chicago and throughout the country, American Jews continue to be leaders in their communities. And all of those Jews in America today owe uh, a thank you to Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz for creating Jewish American Heritage Month of May. So I thank you and I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. And let, let me also just thank you for your leadership as a ranking member of uh, the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection for the, Com for the Energy and Commerce Committee. And your leadership in the area of health care uh, has been incredibly important for America. And uh, I think it's interesting, you, you, first of all, you, you taught me something that I didn't know tonight. I did not know that there are two Jewish players on the Chicago Bears. Okay. So I, I, and one of your staffers was joking with, one, with my staffer today, uh, saying that there are actually more Jews on the Chicago Bears than there are in the Illinois delegation. That's right. <laughs> Which is really kind of ironic, actually. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. So now it's my privilege to, uh, to introduce a friend, acknowledge a friend and colleague from the neighboring district to mine, uh, someone who is a uh, relatively newer member who has some big shoes to fill but has uh, done so capably, serves as a member of the House Committee on the Judiciary and the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, was a state senator in the state of Florida, and I'm fortunate that I don't need his bio as a cheat sheet because I know him so well, uh, my, our, our colleague from the great state of Florida, Congressman Ted Deutsch. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to my dear friend, Congressman Washington Schultz, and thank you for your committed work to making sure that, that not only this special order hour took place, takes place tonight, but for your work in ensuring that Jewish American Heritage Month became a reality. Um, you're to be commended for that, and I think we're all the better for it, and I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Mr. Speaker, uh, I rise to celebrate the seventh annual Jewish American Heritage Month, an opportunity for our nation to recognize the many contributions of Jewish Americans throughout our history. America's Jewish community has helped shape our country since its inception. Jewish Americans have courageously served in our armed forces in every major conflict in our nation's history. They've also helped drive, American, drive America as a powerhouse of economic innovation contributing key advances in everything from science and medicine to the law and the arts. Today, as we mark this year's Jewish American Heritage Month here in Congress, I'd like to highlight our community's tremendous contributions to American social policy. Jewish Americans have a long history of shaping our political priorities as a nation. I'm proud to be part of a community that has led efforts to protect the most vulnerable, to ensure fairness in our justice system, to promote economic opportunity, and to safeguard the religious freedoms and liberties of all Americans. We need, no look no, we need look no further than Social Security, a program that helps keep 50 million Americans economically secure each year. Serving on the committee that helped establish Social Security was Wilbur Cohen, a man who eventually was appointed by President Kennedy 
as an Assistant Secretary for Legislation of Health, Education, and Welfare. As a member of President Johnson's cabinet, Wilbur Cohen's influence over issues that impact America's seniors continued to grow, and many today regard him as the man who built Medicare. Jewish Americans also took an active role in our nation's struggle for civil rights. In the 1950s and 60s, Jewish Americans were passionately engaged in the struggle for civil rights. Rabbi Stephen Wise, a great American Jewish leader, was one of the founders of the NAACP. And he made the case that civil rights were not only a Jewish issue, but civil rights was a quintessential Jewish issue. He understood and believed firmly that the Jewish community, that the nation, America was stronger when prejudice was defeated and when equal rights were extended to all. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marched with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in Selma. And in reflecting upon that march, Rabbi Heschel said, when I marched in Selma, my legs were praying. It was an understanding, his understanding, his commitment to what he viewed as essentially the holy work of lifting up all Americans and ensuring equal rights for all. Several prominent Jewish activists, including Michael Schwerner and Andrew Goodman, lost their lives along with African-American activist James Cheney while fighting for the right to vote alongside organizers in the South. And perhaps there is no greater indication of Jewish Americans' involvement in the struggle for civil rights than the fact that both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, two landmark pieces of civil rights legislation, were both drafted as legislation at the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. As a Jewish American, I'm honored to be part of a community that throughout our nation's history has helped make America a more fair and a more just nation. A nation where opportunity extends to all, where everyone can be lifted up by, giving, by being given the chance to succeed. A commitment to ensuring that seniors live lives of dignity, where poor receive the support that they need when the times are most difficult. And finally, it is the respect for every American, the dignity of every American, that is recognized and fought for still to this day by so many in the Jewish community. Uh, I am so grateful to my friend Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz for helping to ensure that we had the opportunity to share these thoughts here on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives this evening. Uh, I'm grateful for that opportunity. I thank you for it. Uh, and I will yield back to my friend. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your commitment, for your leadership. Uh, it is really a privilege to, to fight side by side with you on behalf of our constituents in South Florida uh, and on behalf of the values that, uh, that, that matter uh, so deeply to our community. It, it really, I, I've watched for many years, actually before you were elected to public office, uh, your commitment to the U.S.-Israel relationship and to a strong and vibrant uh, Jewish state of Israel as an APAC activist, and uh, then as a state senator, and now as a member of Congress and a colleague, and uh, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Thank you. It's now my privilege to, uh, to recognize a, a newer colleague and a newer friend, but someone who uh, I have seen uh, develop as a leader and someone who has uh, stepped up uh, to represent her constituents in the western part of our country, um, which I'm sure is a completely different Jewish experience than, uh, that, than East, Coast, uh, an East Coast experience. But uh, Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici uh, is a new member elected in a special election uh, not even a year ago, and uh, actually uh, just a few short months ago. Uh, and uh, she has uh, stepped up and represents the uh,
Portland area in Oregon, is a member of Congregation Beth Israel, uh, more importantly, and uh, I'm pleased to recognize her here tonight. Thank you so much for yielding me this time, Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz, and for your leadership in Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, it's great to join you and our other colleagues here this evening, and Mr. Speaker, uh, to recognize the contributions that so many Jewish Americans have made uh, to our, our communities, to our states, to our country. And there are many uh, Jewish Americans who could be recognized here this evening and deserve to be recognized for their contributions here uh, this evening in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month, I rise to pay tribute to a great Jewish American, an Oregonian, Mr. Harold Schnitzer. Born in 1923, Harold Schnitzer was the fifth of seven children of Russian immigrants. He was born to Rose and Sam Schnitzer, who took a junk business and turned it into a steel empire. As a boy, Harold earned 25 cents a week for polishing metal at his father's scrapyards. He told his teachers at Lincoln High School in Portland that his future was in steel. And by the age of 16, he came back here to the East. He was studying at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, from which he graduated in 1944. He served in World War II. He dealt scrap metal during his time in the Army. And he was expected to take over the family business, but something happened. He didn't want to compete with his brothers. So he left to start his own real estate company, Harsh Investment Properties. Now, throughout his years, throughout his life, Harold, along with his wife, Arlene Schnitzer, generously supported education, health care, cultural and Jewish institutions and organizations, not only in Portland, but throughout the state of Oregon. Harold Schnitzer lost his life last year in 2011 at the age of 87. Now there is no question that he embodied Tikkun Olam. He made the world a better place. I want to thank you for this opportunity, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, to pay tribute to a, a great Jewish American, but also to say thank you again for uh, making Jewish American Heritage Month a reality so that others can learn about the contributions of Jewish Americans around this great country. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I yield back my time. Thank you so much, and thank you uh, for your service on the House Committee on the Budget. We serve on that committee together, and uh, you have represented presented your constituents well, and I appreciate you honoring the contributions of uh, Jewish Americans across this country here tonight. Uh, now it's my privilege to uh, bring to the rostrum, <laughs> for lack of a better term, a, uh, a friend and colleague who <laughs> represents uh, the southern region of California and in San Diego, yes, and who has been an incredible leader in the arms, on the Armed Services Committee, uh, who has uh, definitely, in her own right, been a, a Jewish leader and uh, as a Jewish woman, someone who has taken a leadership role in the area of the Armed Services, not, not only not traditional for women, uh, but uh, the one that we have, a, we have a story to tell about uh, Jewish involvement throughout our uh, American military history, and uh, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about that later, but thank you so much, right. Congresswoman Susan Davis. Thank you, and I'm going to thank um, my colleague, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, for having us together to talk about Jewish American Heritage Month uh, this, this evening. It's, it's important for us to do that, and whenever we think uh, of perfecting our union. The president spoke about this a little bit today as he hosted a number of uh, individuals in Jewish community and people from around the country today. And the thing that I always think about is tikkun olam, because it is part of our tradition to repair the world. Many, many Jewish people came to the United States having left a community in which they weren't able to make contributions. And I think that's partly why in bringing some talents and some skills, and, and yes, in many cases, they weren't skills that were honed very well when they first came to this country, but they developed those. And in developing those skills and in making a contribution and becoming treasures for each of their communities, they clearly made a great deal of effort to repair the world. 
they continue to do that in so many, many ways. There's another tradition that we have. It's called Sadaka. And it's about caring for others. It's about giving to others. It's about engaging people in that effort. It's about going down to soup kitchens from time to time. It's about bringing homeless people in to your synagogue or into your temple during the winter. It's about engaging all the time because we know that that's important to do. And so that caring of Sadaka goes back to so many of the traditions that we all share. It's about the golden rule. It's about taking care of one another. It's about treating people the way that we want to be treated. That's very, very much a part of our heritage. I'm going to share a little story today, and it's a story that I think my colleague is going to be laughing a little bit about, because it's not something that I would ordinarily do, but I had a chance to read a little bit about a very special Jewish woman. Her name was Thelma Tibby Eisen, and she was born in 1922 and lives today. And I tell this story because she was very, very famous as a professional athlete in America. Probably people who don't uh, know about Jewish women in athletics or in baseball uh, would know of her, but those who do would know that name. And I bring that up because my colleague <laughs> brought me into the first and only bipartisan women's softball team here in the capital. And uh, I have to tell you, I have to share my story, is I never played in professional, in not professional, I never played team sports in my life. In fact, I probably picked up a baseball maybe once to kind of hit somebody, <laughs> but I really don't remember doing that at all. So when I was asked by my colleague to, to join with her in this team, which is supporting young survivors of breast cancer, I, I thought, well, that's crazy for me to even do this because I, I, I surely can't do any, any, you know, I can't make a contribution to this team. But I've done it because I've, I've cared about the cause, certainly of young survivors who have breast cancer, and largely because there are a number of Jewish women who, by virtue of their genes, have a um, propensity to, to develop um, breast cancer. And right around the time that I actually had agreed to be on this team, and uh, actually this even goes back to walking in the three-day march for breast cancer, uh, I learned that my sister had breast cancer. And fortunately, she's been able to overcome that. But it was something that I knew and I had to take uh, in account in my own life as well. But I wanted to share this story because uh, I, I enjoyed reading about Thelma, about Tibby Eisen. I'm going to share that. One of the most versatile and talented Jewish professional athletes in America was Gertrude Tibby Eisen. She was born in Los Angeles in 1922, and she was a star of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, the only professional women's league in baseball history. And the Women's Hardball League lasted from 1943 until 1954, and she was one of at least four Jewish women in that professional league. As its only Jewish superstar and a pioneer in American women's sports, she was an outstanding athlete in her native Los Angeles, and she started playing semi-pro softball at age 14. And when the league was formed in 1943, she won a spot on the Milwaukee team, which was moved the next year to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And her best season was in 1946 when she led the league in triples. She stole 128 bases and made the all-star team. Now, the part of this story that I particularly like was that Eisen's family was very ambivalent about the career choice that this, quote, nice Jewish girl had made, although she ultimately won all of their respect. And I quote, we played a big charity game in Chicago for a Jewish hospital, Eisen recalled in an interview with historian David Spanner. My name and picture were in every Jewish newspaper. My uncle, who had said, quote, you shouldn't be playing baseball, you'll get a bad reputation, a bad name, was in the stands, bursting with pride that I was there. 
When she retired from professional baseball in 1952, she settled in Pacific Palisades area and became a star for the Orange Lionette softball team, leading them to a world championship in 1993. She helped establish the women's exhibit at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, Cooperstown, New York. and she wanted to have all this recorded to keep the baseball league in the limelight. It gets pushed into the background, she said, just as women have been pushed into the background forever. If they knew more about our league, perhaps in the future some women will say, hey, maybe we can do it again. Well, that's probably how all of us feel here in our bipartisan effort in, in women's softball. We're going to play this, this game on June 20th. We're going to play against um, all of our, our women colleagues in, in, the, in TV and radio and, and in print, the media, and we certainly hope that we're going to bring back a, a victory here. <laughs> And if I, if I may, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to just highlight a few people, really my contemporaries in San Diego who have made such a contribution because they're well known in our community and certainly when we think of Jewish American Heritage Month, we can't but help think of these individuals who today are continuing to make a contribution. Uh, two of them uh, have, have passed on. One, of course, is Jonas Salk that we all know very well. The Salk Institute of San Diego continues to educate our scientists for our country and really for the, for the world globally. I've had an opportunity to meet with a number of young scientists there from time to time and their enthusiasm and their desire to, to really cure diseases in our country are just uh, always inspiring and I, I think of them often when I think of the Salk Institute. The other person who I wanted to highlight very briefly is a gentleman named Saul Price. Saul Price um, was the founder of uh, Price Club, he and his family, and whenever you think of ingenuity and innovation, entrepreneurs, um, he, he was uh, great, great at this, and he also founded an organization that I had an opportunity to be the executive director of uh, in, its, in its early years, the Aaron Price Fellows Program, educating a very, very diverse group of young people to repair the world, to find in civic life as a student and then as they go on as adults to find a way to really make a contribution to their community. It's a wonderful program. The young people come here to Washington every year. And finally, to just say uh, in regard to great contributors uh, in our community and across, across the world today, Dr. Irwin and Joan Jacobs, um, Dr. Jacobs, the founder of Qualcomm, along with Dr. Viterbi in San Diego, who have made such extraordinary, extraordinary contributions and continue to do that every day. It's a real honor to be in a community where their philanthropy is so well known. And finally, we have a very active group of Jewish war veterans in San Diego, and I just wanted to thank Alan Molesky, who has been veterans of the, of the Veteran of the Year in San Diego and continues to reach out and make a great contribution and remind everybody of his extraordinary stu uh, story as a Jewish war veteran. Thank you very much to my colleague for bringing us together today, and it's been my honor to have an opportunity to speak about Jewish American Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you so much. Th thank you, Congresswoman Davis. Uh, thank you for your leadership and for sharing the stories of the uh, important contributions that Jews in the San Diego community in America uh, have, uh, have made to the fabric of American history. It's now my, my pleasure and my privilege to ask my colleague from the great state of Connecticut, Chris Murphy, to, uh, to, to share some things. I, I had. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a reunion of sorts uh, a number of years ago when, uh, when uh, Mr. Murphy and I, uh, along with uh, Mr. Ryan from Ohio and uh, our former colleague, Congressman Meek from Florida, uh, we used to spend a little time down here on the House floor uh, around this time of night or, le or later in the 30-something working group. And you, you may still actually be eligible to, uh, to participate. I, I no longer would be. Barely. Um, may, maybe, maybe I'd be part of the something in 30-something. In <laughs> um, 
But I did have a chance to meet your fantastic Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman today at the uh, Jewish American Heritage Month reception at the White House. And uh, she's uh, obviously a, a, an incredible leader, an example of, uh, of the political leadership that is part of the contributions that uh, American Jews have made to, uh, to, to American life. Mr. Murphy? Well, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. And uh, I don't think that we were ever allowed down on the House floor this early. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, normally close to the witching hour when uh, myself and Right. Representative Ryan, you and uh, Representative Meek were down here, but uh, it is wonderful to uh, be back here. And I was really touched when you approached me earlier today to ask me to come down and say a few words because um, the Murphys are not a very well known Jewish American family. Um, and yet uh, in Connecticut, um, we, are, uh, we are so, so proud uh, of the uh, legacy that we've helped contribute to uh, with respect to Jewish American heritage. Um, and this is a great way to be part of this month's celebration. Um, you know, the, the list is long in Connecticut. Uh, you know, I think about somebody like Annie Fisher, who was one of the pioneers of uh, special education in this country, trying to segment out a different way to teach kids with learning disabilities. She was the first female principal, first female superintendent in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I think about a young guy by the name of Kid Kaplan, who was uh, from my district, from Meriden, Connecticut, was a uh, featherweight champion uh, of the world, uh, one of the top ten featherweights uh, by most people's uh, estimates. Um, but I think maybe most uh, about uh, some of the political legacy that uh, Jewish Americans from Connecticut have left this country. Um, I think a lot about uh, Abraham Ribicoff. Um, Abraham Ribicoff uh, was everything in Connecticut. He was our governor. He was our senator. He was our congressman. Um, and um, he faced uh, not so quietly uh, the prejudice that so many Jewish Americans faced as they entered into political life and commercial life uh, throughout the last 100 years. He talked openly uh, when he first ran for governor about walking into social halls and hearing prejudiced whispers uh, throughout the room as he walked in. Um, he also talked about taking uh, that prejudice uh, head on. He'd walk up to the podium and he'd talk about the fact that he had lived the American dream as the um, son of uh, Polish immigrants, as uh, a young guy who grew up working in zipper and buckle factories uh, throughout the Hartford region, that he was living the American dream, and that if he could do it, so could everybody else and their kids in that room. He's probably best known for uh, a, a moment uh, at the podium of the Democratic National Convention in 1968 when uh, Chicago police were outside treating protesters fairly roughly. He was the one member of the political elite to stand up on that podium and call them out for their tactics. Uh, and even with the mayor of that city sitting in the front row calling him some pretty unfriendly names, he uh, kept his cool and is credited with essentially marginalizing that kind of uh, violence, um, certainly uh, with historical hindsight. Um, and, and maybe most importantly is that um, Abraham Rubikoff also saw uh, his role as one of the leading American Jewish political figures in this country uh, to help pave the way for others. Um, he had a young intern um, not long after he became U.S. Senator named Joe Lieberman. Um, he hired um, in the early 1970s as his administrative assistant, a uh, young hotshot lawyer named Richard Blumenthal. Uh, and uh, the two of them both uh, given their political sea legs by uh, Abraham Ribicoff are today uh, proudly serving as Connecticut's two United States senators, uh, both part of our proud political tradition in Connecticut uh, of uh, Jewish, particip Jewish American participation uh, in American politics. So um, I'm really thrilled to uh, be down here with you to uh, share my gratitude for what Jewish Americans in Connecticut have meant to our cultural life, to our educational life, to our sporting life, and yes, uh, to our uh, political life. Uh, Representative Washington Schultz, thank you for your leadership and thank you for uh, allowing me and asking me to come down this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Murphy, and, and thank you for your leadership on, as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee as well and your commitment and support to uh, a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, also an important issue to, uh, to those of us in the Jewish